I'm going to get us back into the PowerPoint. And thank you, Dave. <laughs> and Dirk. <laughs> All right, so I can go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> I love the graphics. The, the title kind of very nice. <clears throat> so just what uh, Dirk said, I guess the main point, and what Chris said as well, the main point is to have a, a little bit of a simulated reality to say, all right, you've learned this, that, and the other thing. Can you apply that knowledge in hopefully a realistic setting where we can actually see these ideas at work. You've talked about demand, you've talked about incentives and utility, marginal benefit, marginal cost. Let's see this in action and see how it makes sense instead of just looking at a graph or the theory. A theory of all that stuff. Here's the intro screen. This is actually a change that you guys recently made that I like. This the first time you load the game, it puts you through this mini tutorial. Hey, let's practice building a dorm, let's practice hiring a person, let's practice setting tuition. But then, if you play the game a second or a third time, she doesn't appear. She's just, she's gone. She's just a, she's a one-time thing, so that's pretty good. <laughs> and these, uh, th through playing the game, these are just some specific things that I've uh, analyzed here. Uh, the game is full of choices. So the student, I guess, implicitly has to deal with the, the economic concept of scarcity from the beginning. You have a limited amount, specifically in this game, of funding. So how do you spend your funding? Do you spend it on arts, sciences, football? Do you want to hire an intelligent staffer, or not? do you just want to try to go it blind on your own? And a lot of other events can come up, too, to help you uh, understand costs and benefits. There's, uh, they've built random events into the game, and the random events give you a choice. Do you want to do A, B, or C? And there's going to be benefits and costs to those choices as well. I've got some examples in a little bit as well. But then you can also look at the short run and the long run. Okay, is there an immediate benefit to this, or is there going to be long run <coughs> recurring costs to building this huge building that I might not be able to take care of over time? Demand is uh, shown in the game explicitly too. All right, you have a school or a building. How many people would actually want to use this? this educational service. You can say, well, is it, is it worth it? Is the cost worth the demand? And demand can then be linked to revenue. How many people would be in this school in this project paying for it? Are the, are the prices and the revenue going to cover that cost? Utility, that's just the economic way of saying happiness, which there is an actual happiness uh, number in the game that we try to maximize as well as uh, money and student population. And also, there's a little bit of uh, imperfect information as well. Um, the, the advisors try to help you with that, but it's not always, as Dirk said earlier, it's not always as clear cut. Here's what you'll do, and here's the result. Here is the number. Students, there's a little bit of a variation there, variability. We don't exactly know what's going to happen as well as the random events, too. Well, hey, maybe my nuclear power plant melted down. Now, now uh, what do we do? <laughs> Um, and just to back up, I guess, and explain for anyone who, who may not have gotten the idea, <clears throat> excuse me, the game itself is sort of a campus builder style game. So your cast is this fictional president, I guess, of a university who is given a certain amount of terms to build and then maintain uh, <coughs> the financial viability of a campus. So as part of that, you have to build buildings, respond to events, as, as Dave was saying, uh, deal with different policy decisions and things like that. So that, that's the basic sort of metaphor behind the game. There's also two ways to measure success here, right? Because you've got revenues, you know, or <coughs> and you've got happiness, right? And so one of the things that, that I specifically emphasize in my class is that this is a class about economics, which a student would normally think of as being about money, and how you spend money with a budget constraint. Well, then it's fine. That's embedded in the game. But there's also this broader notion that economics, at least by the way I teach it, is how can we get students to use these tools in any decision they might be making? And you know, it's not just about the supermarket, the stock market, financial market. It's about all of these types of choices and decisions. This game perfectly embodies that because you can have different leaderboards for you know, how successful are you in generating happiness for your students or student population size. You can get a couple of different ways. Really great that way. Yeah, I was uh, able to play the other day. I think I had a large, large sum of money. But very, I think it was zero happiness. I think I jacked up tuition, 
That's zero health care, zero food. <laughs> they're, sick. they're all sick and starving, but they're learning. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so here's it's just an example with these. When you uh, on the style building on the on the map screen, we'll show a little bit. It's got this nice isometric layout here where you can build your buildings and your uh, facilities on campus. There's upfront expenses, but then there's also maintenance expenses. Hey, you want to build an uh, agricultural school? Here it is. But then it says here's the cost per turn to keep this operational. And those costs, you could assume, well, taking care of the electricity, paying the faculty in that facility as well. But and there's also non-monetary expenses that you can consider costs. Um, one of the random events I remember occurring was uh, one was do you want to allow alcohol on campus? And one was, do you want to accept or reject co-ed habitation in the dorms? And giving the, a certain answer to those questions <laughs> can impose a happiness cost on you. If you ban alcohol and ban co-ed living, students, they're not happy. And they're saying, no, that's, that's ruining my college experience. So maybe you could save money. And I think there was another, there was a, a cost-benefit analysis in one of those. Uh, there was some, wasn't there some group that said, hey, if you ban alcohol, we'll give you money for that to prevent, because, you, hey, you're preventing underage drinking, but then the students are upset. So it's a, hap, it's a dollar gain, but a happiness loss. So how can you measure that? It's a good way to measure those costs and benefits that way as well. And here's, here's just another example right here. Here's a random event that I put. A law conference wants to, as you guys put it, uh, chill, <laughs> chill at your pad. Costs $12,000 for putting these guys up, but then 100 uh, P, that's a demand right there. Is so this 100. bothering you? Should I shut the door? Okay. Okay. Um, there's an increase in demand for the law school because now your university is more well known. So, And then that, that's just the benefits. All right. What's an action you can take to get you more revenue, more population, more more students? There we go. So here's a picture here. There's this nice isometric layout there. The demand right there and the information needed. And this is pretty good. At the top, at least, that is the new spending per turn. That's, that could be considered perhaps real life information that the campus would actually have. Here's how much it's going to cost to run and operate this, this building. So you can upgrade it for 60000 It's going to cost 18000 per turn if you upgrade it. And at the bottom there, that's the demand. That's effectively how many, correct me if I'm wrong here, how many students this department then would be able to house. So level one, you got a small school. Level five, you got a big school. But then, of course, there's additional expenses with that as well. And that's the cost benefit again. Costs are more spending per turn plus the fixed one-time upgrade cost. But 1,800 students now, there's maybe a benefit. More students, more tuition, more population as as well. And then there's a choice right here. This is a policy that you can choose. How much tuition would you like to charge? Cost benefits, right? Higher tuition could perhaps to an extent mean higher revenue. But maybe if you charge tuition too high, maybe population's not as high, revenue might go down. Tuition is too low, on the other hand, you won't make any money. You, you'll get the screen that says you have declared bankruptcy after 13 terms. And then your your university uh, fails. You want to talk to yeah, that? I mean, so, uh, <laughs> one of the neat things about utility theory um, is that it's, it's kind of hard for students to really grasp. Um, they're they're not they're much more comfortable living in a world of, of easy numbers uh, and thinking about the relationship between price and quality of purchase. Um, and again, trying to extend what they've learned in the course in a different direction that's going to prepare them, this is an important part for me, for what they're going to see in the next course, which is Econ 302. It's a much more developed model of consumer decision making that incorporates many more variables. So, so I like to think of this as a, as a capstone, but also a stepping stone here. You know, and so getting them to think about all these things and how they interact with each other is what economists do and what differentiates somebody who's a higher level thinker from somebody who's just got sort of rudimentary skills. Uh, and the game does this really well, uh, again, by just sort of giving you the opportunity to, in this particular case, uh, think about whether or not you want to have big class sizes or small class sizes, how that feeds back. Um, so I'm going 
and with these advisors here, they can, <laughs> they can help you make decisions here of parodies of current and past presidents here. But the, once again, cost and benefits here. Cost of hiring smarter and higher up PhD level advisors, they obviously cost more monetary expenses, but they can effectively increase the happiness of your population by steering you more in an appropriate direction. You know, maybe the, the finance advisor, the CFO could say, here's what I think tuition should be to help increase our revenues and not take too much of a happiness hit, for example. And the recruiter could say, hey, maybe I think we should increase our arts and, and agriculture and not have so much emphasis on, on engineering. And uh, if you upgrade all three of them to level three, they give you a nice little bonus tip at the, the bottom here, talk, talking about population and happiness. So they can give you some hints there. And when you have nobody hired, you get no pictures on the right, there's no help. But if you do have one or more of these people hired at level one, two, or three, and a situation, one of those random events opens up, or you open up a policy window, you get a click on one of the people and it will give you advice and say, well, hey, do I – it'll say, I think we should change or I think we should not change this policy. So the advisors are that's – that's what you're spending your money on, you're trying to get some advice from them. And there's, a, there's some advice from what's, – what's Bill Clinton's name? William Clifton or something? William Clifton. Clifton. Okay. <clears throat> and, and the neat part about the uh, advisors is you have to put yourself in the role of a student who's playing this game. You've got two types of students who are going to play this game. One who's like, yeah, I'm playing a game <coughs> with Tom. This is awesome, right? And they're going to explore it and look around, and they're going to investigate. They'll try to figure out whether it's fair to have level three advisors and level two. And then you've got the person who, oh, yeah, i got to find this game for econ. You know? And so how many turns do I have? You know, so what this does is it, it, it creates a layer here where the game is not going to be trivial to win or too difficult to succeed at. So, and this is what you know we talk a lot about with Zach and Chris is how do you create the right balance in this game in order to get it to a point where the, the, the typical student can play the game, have some success, and realizes at the end, yeah, I was using econ to actually foster that success in the game. So. So this information, the, per the imperfect information is a crucial component in making it all come together. That, that's just a picture of my college. <laughs> With all those nice buildings on it. Yeah. On the far right there, that's my dorms and my campus area. There's a dining hall and, a t and a, I think a student union over there. The top center is where I've got all my schools, engineering, math, liberal arts. Agriculture is there on the bottom left there, or on the far left. It's got a little farm that I imagined. And uh, in the bottom center there, you've got your football fields and your concert pavilion. Does the layout have an effect on, on the gameplay at all, or is it purely just doesn't make a difference if the dorms are all in one area or if you have all spread out? I mean, it, yeah, there's no uh, ge yeah. geographic. Yeah, we, we thought about that. I said, well, what if I build a, what if I build a coal plant next to the dorm? Yeah, that might. Yeah, you know, that, that is actually something that is useful, but I think it's hard to be built into the game yeah. because when you have negative externalities, negative externalities and positive externalities based on building locations, you could certainly see that increasing the happiness of the cohort that came to the university. I just think that it's more difficult to build in. At least that's my understanding. So. We did not press on that. <laughs> <laughs> this is, and you can look at the screen at any point in the game too, right? This is the, the history screen, and for all of your, I guess I don't have any world statistics or university statistics checked here, but I've got some demand levels checked. So your demand is basically saying how much, uh, what levels, I guess, have you chosen for art, science, and law? But you can also look at what are the world statistics costs and in terms of land, government funding. Government funding, I've seen that as the random events in the game. But how did you guys calculate the world cost of like labor and food? How was that built in? Well, 
So what, what basically those world labor statistics are meant to simulate kind of a market, uh, in a sense, a world market in the game, and they will influence things like the cost of your building. So for example, the price of labor will go up and down throughout the course of the game. And uh, what we tried to do was set it up in such a way that there's actually a pattern to it. So a, a savvy student will look at this and be able to get some idea of, well, it looks like now is going to be one of the cheaper times to build. Now is going to be a really expensive time to build. I should build now and hold off, sort of save my money during really expensive times. Uh, because one of the things we wanted to do was, because uh, Dirk and Dave both teach large sections of courses, we wanted to build certain things into the game that you could just sort of broadly say to any student, if you were building buildings between turn 10 and 20, you weren't paying attention, right? You were doing it wrong. Or you were doing it for non-economic reasons, because the, the smart thing to do, based on the way that uh, the, the market, I guess, was going, uh, would have been to hold off and wait until things got a little bit cheaper. Is that included then in the building screen? Because earlier I had the picture where it said engineering cost 60000 to build. Would that then change the screen and say uh, engineering now costs 73000 right. to build? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. All right. And then at the top there, I, I failed. There, I declared that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are successful, right there, I have a... Uh, Fifty million dollars and a student population of 127,000, and everyone is completely happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a successful university is, right there. And Two and a, what that? Only took you 100 turns. 100 turns is the is the max, right? That's where mm -hmm. the game stops. So I got this mega metropolitan, two and a half times the size of Penn State, where everyone loves it. <laughs> <laughs> you vying to become your president? <laughs> yeah, that's right. But that's the, the, on the screen, that's the leaderboard. So eventually, if you get 100 students playing this, you can see, well, hey, how am I doing compared to the rest? It looks like I'm doing something good. Or it looks like, uh, uh, who's Kata at the bottom? Um, didn't do so hot there. <laughs> so <laughs> she, <laughs> he, he, he or she could say, I obviously didn't think this through. And uh, she could try to maybe find Econ Dave and say, what's what do you and I think that's a, you know, the, the idea of the leaderboard, too, gives another opportunity to, to look at reflection in a different way. I mean, obviously with a class of 300 students, right, uh, neither Dirk nor Dave probably has the time to, to talk to every single student about their performance in the game. But with something like this, you could take a little snapshot of it, maybe see the top two students in the class, and maybe just have them stand up <laughs> and say, what was your strategy, right? Or talk to the students who did the worst and say, well, Clearly, you've done something <laughs> exemplary here. How were you able to do this? Uh, or anywhere else. Uh, well, well, well. <laughs> the first idea was great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but again, just another uh, potential uh, reality of teaching large sections of the course uh, and making this something that you could have teachable moments with. These, uh, this kind of, I think this might be my last slide here. I think it is. I wasn't quite sure about this. Our, the meetings that Dirk and I have came over here with involve discussing. Uh, you guys show us the game, say here's what we've done, and then we ask questions, can this be done? That's how that earlier discussion came of the externalities. Well, can you make it so that if you build a coal mine next to the dorm, it's bad and it's, eh, that's kind of difficult to implement? And we, this, it's kind of been the back and forth that's been, you guys have been designing the game and we've just been saying, well, here's some more ideas we can throw in. Um, so maybe one thing that I've suggested is we, there's already been a level effect. Originally, there was a deep, there you had $250,000 to start. Now it's $25,000. So we started off at the lower level, but I still think we need to decrease the growth rate of money because the money can still, even though you're starting lower, the, the rate of it can still just explode into millions of dollars. And I wonder if the next thing we could do is just make a more active role for advisors. And that's, I think, where me and Dirk can help you to send you a bunch of information, say, here's something the advisor could say or should say given this list of situations. Because right now, I think when I was looking, I think the advisors give information, but it's information that's kind of already placed in other parts of the game. So I think instead of giving information, we could have them say, here's what I think you should do. Another idea, and I don't know if you guys can agree or disagree with this, is should an advisor be a prerequisite before doing certain things? Like before, before you build level five, like, hey, we need, a, we need a guy to manage this. We need CFO level two. That's something I thought of. I don't know if you think that's a decent idea or not. 
I think it's consistent with game theory. Yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, it would, it would it, now, there's, now there's more costs to doing this action. That's an interesting idea. So there's many ways, you know, things you can think of that you can embed into this game. That's the wonderful part about it. <laughs> From our perspective over here as educators, I don't know about the designer side of it, because uh, that just means there's never-ending, you know, essential requests. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, Dave's idea of, of the revenue growth rate, that's consistent with diminishing returns <coughs> from an activity. You know, so if you can throttle something back after a while and say, well, wait a second, that didn't work as well as it used to work, that's, that's a very powerful idea. The students understand, but they don't, they don't get it when we teach the theory as much as they would then experience it. That's kind of how I see this all fitting together. She experiences these ideas firsthand, and you either succeed or you fail, and you can just blow up the game and start over again until you succeed. But, but that's actually something incredibly valuable is you get the chance to, to reboot or restart, uh, whereas oftentimes, you know, you take an exam in my class, and you succeed or you fail, and there's no, there's no redo, right? You know, so this is like a game where you can redo and learn along the way. That's a much better pedagogical uh, way of learning. I have a good question. When do you introduce this game? The beginning, at the end, We have not actually had to worry about that yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> the game is being uh, class tested here shortly. Yeah. So uh, I think what I plan to do is give them, I have three exams uh, along with a lot of other activities, but my second exam occurs in the 10th week of classes. I, I was inclined to simply give them the first 10 weeks, learn the bulk of the economics, and then in the 11th week of class, come in and say, hey, we've gotten to the part of the course where I'd like for you to think big, and here's a project we can work on now for the next couple of weeks. That's how we might. Thank you. Um, if it would be helpful, um, I can jump in and maybe show a few minutes of actual gameplay. Oh, yeah. everyone there, is, there is a question uh, from Adobe Connect. Um, this is from Shivani. My apologies if I pronounced that incorrectly. Sorry, I joined a little late. Is it possible to use this game in our Econ 102 course at Penn State Harrisburg? <coughs> So I, you know, certainly that might be Hazelton. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, this was designed uh, to be something that once it's built, you know, can be shared. I think we're designing it specifically to, to Dirk and Dave's specifications because I know they teach a large majority of Econ 102 students here at University Park. But we're happy to make this available as soon as it's complete to anyone who's interested in, in using. It. Okay. Now, Chris, before you start playing the game, um, <coughs> are you on Adobe Connect? So I just logged in. All right, so I'm going to bump you up to host, and then you can start sharing the screen. Okay. John Shank also has a question. A follow-up would be, how would econ faculty <coughs> and other campuses at PSU use this? Yeah. So really, the way we've designed this, I guess there are two possible answers to that question. I'm not sure how it was meant. Uh, we've designed this in such a way that it's really meant to be hands-off for Dirk and Dave to use. So their interest in changing of values or, or adding new equations to the game or new scenarios, that's something that we can set up behind the scenes. It's really meant to be something that once the students get a hold of it, they just run it on their own. Uh, and it, it doesn't require any intervention. It doesn't require any monitoring or hosting uh, from the faculty perspective. Uh, as far as literally getting access to it, that would be just something that, okay, yeah, just uh, send me an email. I guess it would be the easiest way. Um, I should say, so this is in development now, as Dirk and Dave mentioned, um, we're getting ready to start pilots with their students. Uh, the hope is to be able to use this in one of their classes come the fall semester. Uh, and so beyond that, we can start thinking more about anyone who's interested in using it maybe uh, after fall. <laughs> oh, sorry. They're all the same email address, so. <laughs> okay. Everybody's got it? All right, good. Okay. And is the game set up as an online game? Yes, yeah, so it is uh, It's flash-based. Sorry, it looks like there's a little bit of lag coming through. Um, <coughs> but yeah, it's a flash-based game. Um, I should also mention that, that thanks to Elizabeth's help, we've actually been doing a lot of work to try and get it uh, to be accessibility compliant as well. 
Uh, obviously, that's a big concern for a large class or any class uh, at Penn State uh, is that the game will actually uh, be useful for everyone in the class. So, yeah, sorry it's a little choppy. I guess over the wireless connection here, it runs a lot smoother uh, face to face. But this is what the main interface looks like, and this is what a student would start uh, the game with, which is basically like. Uh, from here, they have the ability to select the kind of buildings that they want to make. So we have dorm style buildings, uh, various academic style buildings, athletic facilities, uh, power buildings, so a dining common for food, uh, and then sort of lifestyle buildings like a, a student union building or a health center, things like that. Uh, there are policies that students can choose. These, uh, other than tuition, which is something that basically is, is tied to your revenue, are meant to be ways to help students uh, reduce costs or make decisions of trade-off, right? Do I want happier students at the cost of more money per term for health care? Uh, something along those lines. Uh, this is the staff screen uh, that Dave mentioned earlier where you can choose or not uh, to hire different staff members. Each one focuses on a particular area, so the CFO will tell you about finances. The recruiter will talk to you about student population, uh, for example. Uh, back to the history screen after I build something. Lay down an engineering building, and that's really all. That's all it is, as far as the building is concerned. It's just sort of a click-and-place interface. We wanted something that would be fairly easy for anyone. Uh, this is not a Twitch kind of game, so being a gamer is not really something that helps you because we want it to be good for <laughs> everyone. <laughs> it's not a first-person shooter. Right, right exactly. <laughs> um, so this is the history screen, and, and Dave talked a little bit about this earlier. Uh, in addition to all the graphs and the charts that are on the bottom of the screen, the top part of the screen actually has a turn-by-turn -turn review of everything you've done, uh, as well as some more detailed breakdown of your costs and how things are working, your population. Uh, this is really meant as kind of the reflection screen, and hopefully the, the students that are really paying attention to the economics concepts will spend a lot of time uh, visiting this screen. Uh, this is where you can take a look at you know, comparing the demand of a level one art school versus a level one level one literal liberal art school uh, or engineering school or math school. Um, you can take a look at all the different uh, economic forces that are driving the market, so the cost of food, for example, the cost of land. Uh, you'll notice the graph is a little bit fuzzy and it's intentionally designed that way. Um, Dirk and Dave were clear that they wanted sort of imperfect information. I don't have any advisors now, so basically my game is kind of guessing. Uh, and what the, the uh, future might hold for these products, not knowing the actual values. If you hire advisors, that tightens up a little bit. <coughs> um, Zoom just lets you take a sort of a grand look at your campus for no particular purpose. Uh, and then the <laughs> leaderboards. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's fun to take a look. Just I got <laughs> And uh, so I'll just go through and build a couple more buildings. Hopefully I don't go bankrupt really quickly. Uh, we've tried to tighten this up so it's a lot harder than it used to be. <coughs> uh, to go bankrupt or to succeed? Uh, it's a lot harder to succeed than it used to be. We're still changing some, some numbers uh, on the fly, but as so you can see here, I'm just building a couple of buildings. And you can see my costs are changing, my monetary supply is changing, my students are pretty happy now, my population is also changing with every building I build. Uh, after things are down, I have the ability to upgrade uh, certain buildings. And so this is sort of the progression that we want students to go through. Is you can only build so much before you run out of money. And then you'll need to start thinking about, well, do I want to change tuition? Uh, do I want to scale down my policy so that maybe my costs are a little lower? Do I want to get some help from advisors? Uh, and then there's also a turn to just go idle uh, if you don't want to do anything. Uh, at, at Dirk and Dave's request, we added that in. So if students just want to sort of leave their campus alone for a turn, you don't have to spend money or change your policies every turn uh, if you feel like your campus is at a place that you're comfortable with. But the way the game is designed, uh, it's really meant to incentivize action rather than inaction. So you probably will never get to the top of the leaderboard in terms of money or population if you just build two buildings and then idle all of the turns. Uh, it's really meant to encourage you to interact with your campus in some way uh, and make good decisions rather than no decisions. But you can sort of let time pass uh, if you need to save up a little bit of money or something like that. Uh, I can pop up a quick event here as well to show you what that would look like. This stuff on the side is just like an administrative control, right? Right. So that whole gray area on the right-hand side, that's just sort of what we use uh, to actually change uh, code inside of the game. Students won't see that. Right. 
Did you create this engine from scratch, or was this based on something that was pre-existing? So this was actually uh, Zach's handiwork here. Uh, this whole thing was, was his baby. Um, and without getting too technical programmatically, it, it was designed in such a way that uh, Zach can work on some of the real hardcore programming, pr programming of the game, while uh, I can jump in without a lot of programming experience and change numbers, costs, uh, add new events to the game. So it really has broken up the work nicely to make it a more efficient process as well. It should have to be a reusable engine, but there's other disciplines that could benefit from this type of a dynamic. We could swap out the type of buildings and the different uh, interactions. Right. Uh, so this is, again, an example of one of the, the events that could pop up, right? There's a protest of the local <coughs> construction workers union, and that's going to, depending on your response, change your cost structure, right? If you support the union, maybe it costs you less to build things in the future, uh, whereas if you don't, maybe it costs you more. Uh, so these are just the kind of things that we wanted to set up for students to have to make choices on. And had you hired a staff, he'd be there to give you advice right now, wouldn't right. he? You could mouse over or click his picture yes. and he'd tell you something about it? Exactly. He could give you more or less specific information <laughs> depending on what level you hired. Yeah. So you can have a, so the question is about construction workers protesting a work law and you can choose to disagree with the law right. or support the law. Right. And then depending on your response, uh, that will yeah. have an impact on the way that your game yeah. plays out. And for the advisors here, maybe the recruiter and the student advisor might not have any good advice to give here, but the CFO, maybe he'd have something to say about it, ideally. And I think this was really to, to Dirk's point earlier about uh, the, 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 like, the broad nature of economics in the world. We wanted to set students up with a lot of scenarios that could happen or decisions that could, could test their ability to think economically, right? So banning alcohol on campus in the game it's really meant as a clear-cut decision, right? Like, if you ban it, it saves you money, it saves you uh, resources. Uh, but as a student, you probably go out and drink, right? So now you have to think, well, am I really willing to commit to that? And hopefully it tests their own mental ability. <laughs> <laughs> Are any of the um, random events kind of like, I'm thinking of like old Sim City where you've got like Godzilla comes out and like, oh, yeah. <laughs> they have to kind of rebuild. Are there anything, and you know, I, I hate to think about it, but you know, it's like, you know, Virginia Tech with, a, with an active shooter or something, or here with Sandusky. You know, there's obviously stuff that has an impact on the community. Do you have anything um, that interfaces with the game like that? Like at level 50, something happens and you have to kind of rebuild or readjust. So right now, there are some pretty severe events that happen. Uh, there is nothing too controversial, I guess. Um, Fires? Or? Yeah, so there, there are examples. So I think someone mentioned the nuclear power plant example. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you can have a meltdown at your nuclear power plant uh, that can just randomly occur. And, and that's another, I guess, part of this. The events that occur are random for students because you wanted to set up something such that uh, you couldn't just have one student play the game and then post to a blog like, here's the way to win. Uh, so every student is going to be confronted with unique situations that is going to force them to think critically about what to do. Um, and they can choose right, they can choose wrong, they can choose thinking economically or just clicking things randomly. Uh, but it will change their game in some way. Uh, so you can't just sort of copy what other students have done. Uh, there are also buildings and decisions in here that were intentionally placed uh, as sort of tricks, right? There is one of the, the schools that one, for example, it doesn't make any sense to upgrade it past level two, right? But maybe you really have a propensity for medical school. So that anyway. um, and so there, there are things in there that seem like good ideas, but they're not if you really look at the numbers. And there's lots of different levels, I think, to, to the kinds of thinking that can happen. At least we hope. So are there any other <coughs> questions? Just to note on what I said earlier on the, my very last slide, some, one of the suggestions about <coughs> forcing the student to do those advisors. From the programming standpoint, would that be too difficult to implement? Like, uh, before I build a fourth building, all right, if you want to add four colleges, you have to hire a recruit <coughs> or something like that, or just kind of, I, I don't know if I want to say force the students to do it, but kind of take that just additional realism approach, hey, your campus is getting bigger, you need to hire a recruiter, you need to hire a CFO, or is, is could you just like throw a simple if statement in there, hey, you know, it's, if you're trying to do this. We have uh, prerequisites uh, already built into the engine, so an event of hiring a staff member, we can add any event, you can set 
say any event has to happen or any number of events has to happen. Yeah, well, reverse what I said. <coughs> the events would hold the, the prerequisite of having hired. Yeah, because so you, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you could have a, n a number of things in there, like, all right, before you build a, a, a fifth college, you have to hire a level one somebody, or before you upgrade to level three something, you've got to hire level two. Or yeah. How hard would it be sorry, to uh, put in here some sort of space where the, you know, I have a thousand students, <coughs> all of whom have this due on a certain day, where they can get online and sort of just, you know, chat about their experience? Well, writing the game except itself on Facebook is it's already tested and uh, we need to do a little more work and research into um, tapping into the Facebook API okay. uh, so that you can do what you said, chat about it, post to your wall what you've done, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's all possible. You know. So this framework was all built and you went to them and said, okay, we have this game and then you extracted the content from them. Uh, I would yeah. say it probably was a little, uh, little more rudimentary. That we we went to them really with an idea, okay. um, and I think Zach had started to prototype uh, <coughs> a sort of campus builder model of a game. That was not as as this. Mm -hmm. um, and then we sort of went to them and said, "Does this sound like something that could work in your course?" And then from there, we really evolved it a lot to fit their specifications for how they like to teach and the kinds of content they have. Um, I mean, it must be really complicated <coughs> getting all the pieces of information. Was it, was it hard for you guys to put the pieces together, like, you know, all the different decisions that needed to be made and what the ramifications were? I mean, how complicated was that, too? Well, I can't, I guess I can't speak for you guys' perspective. I mean, our philosophy with it was really, one of the first meetings we had with, with Dirk and Dave, we said, what learning objectives would you like yeah. to see uh, exist through this game? <laughs> and then, in subsequent meetings, we made sure that we had a good understanding of what that content was, what kinds of examples they used in class, uh, and then tried to craft events that sort of reinforce that, uh, or at least mimic that sort of behavior. Uh, so really, it was picking their brain uh, yeah. for the content and then making sure that it, it applied in the right way. How long has that process been? Like, how long have you been working on it together? We did meeting. The first meeting, I guess, was last April, and then we've had periodic meetings maybe every two months to talk about content and Right. Although I want to say that, you know, um, this, this has fallen on Zach and Chris, and, you know, they they envisioned this, they brought it to us, they thought through it, and they've contemplated it and, and done everything else. So, I mean, full credit to them. I, you know, I just think of myself as kind of like an external consultant here mm -hmm. who comes in and makes work for them. You know, so I felt like <laughs> that's an okay position for me to be in, but, it's, you know, it's, uh, on the other side, I think it's probably, uh, that's where all the work is. You guys have credit knowledge. I guess the question I have is sort of how could it be applied to other scenarios? And what I was thinking of is we did an off-the-shelf health policy game similar to this, but do you think that could be readapted in this framework? Absolutely. And I think that that's part of the part of the way that Zach designed it was such that that could happen. We wanted to provide some of the lies and so here. You know, this could be a security risk analysis style game where maybe Instead of thinking about economic concepts, you're thinking about protecting infrastructure or something along those lines. Uh, we've had folks say, I can see this as an energy simulator, right? Like this is about balancing power grid. Uh, biology has said, what about the spread of disease, right? An infectious disease kind of simulator. So it's not the most optimistic uh, perspective on it, but I think there's a lot of potential uses for it. Uh, and now that the engine is built, the future applications. But those conversations, the design conversations, we focused on pedagogy, not all the kind of programs and stuff like that. And, and I wonder if you could then get all the disciplines together to discuss it then. You know, you run one scenario and everybody's involved in a different aspect of it, you know, and they come together and discuss that. It seems like it would be really great. And I was wondering about the parameters, like, are you giving them parameters for, for instance, like the cost, you said they're random. So I would go in a different time, the engineering school cost might be different. Mm -hmm. um, were you guys giving them 
parameters, or is that something that you I did think, relative? Well, all that was just based on your land cost, what you said earlier, right? We're going to have some sort of world exogenous prices built in, and these students have to examine that and say, let's work with what I'm given. Okay. Yeah. I think um, we really relied on them for the, the, the philosophy, the idea, the theories behind this. The specific numbers have changed so much that a lot of that's just trying to get uh, to a point of balance. So uh, we just went through a period the last time we got together where this game was sort of monumentally easy uh, to succeed in, and so we tried to tighten down some of the numbers, and we're still doing that. So it's a lot of massaging. Um, but the goal ultimately is to make sure that it falls back on the points that they want to emphasize in class. Yeah, another scenario I was thinking, and maybe other people have scenarios, is something like um, certain historical scenarios like build your empire. Mm -hmm. You don't fun. have the mm -hmm. same infrastructure as you do today, obviously. Right. Yeah. I mean, anything, anything that fits in this, this idea uh, can certainly be in future iterations. Does anyone else either on the phone or here have any other? thoughts on what work, might work or might not work? A couple of things that inspired me, I was wondering if you thought about I, I, a couple of uh, iOS games I've seen, like one Tiny Tower, another one Oregon Hill Village or something. But there's a way in either of those games to go and quote unquote visit your friends' towers or your friends' campuses in this case to kind of see their progress. Live, with like real time, or if it takes somehow snapshots of what they're doing, and you can kind of visit it. But I was wondering in terms of because someone was mentioning, I can't remember who, about you know networking and Facebook or something along that line, uh, social games. I think we we I did we talk, but that it'd have to be kind of like an end game saved thing. Like maybe here's a here's a screenshot of your village. It's the game wasn't meant to be played like this week-long thing like, all right, here's my village, my campus, and it's going to be, I'm going to come to it day after day after day. It's, here's my village, let's let's do this. It's not like this multiple week Farmville type yeah. situation <laughs> where I give you a couple of football fields or something as a gift. And, <laughs> <laughs> and here's my campus. Uh, but, but at the end then, we, we, we did talk about that option, like somehow saving a, a screenshot, a PNG file, and like, here's what I built, but you don't want to necessarily give too much information because, well, he's successful, copy his turns, I win. Right. So. Um, one of the things we talked about in our last meeting actually was having that philosophy, but more as an administrator. So as faculty, Dirk and Dave could jump into someone else's game and say, okay, here's one of the successful students, maybe bring them up in class and sh literally show their campus to the school, but that may not be something that's available to everyone. Right. right. No. It's a do you, it doesn't sound like it, but you guys, do you have any kind of admin screen where you could tweak parameters, or is that? So that's, on this screen, that's that right-hand side, that gray and black. Oh, area. okay. That's what this is designed to be, yeah. Oh, okay, so that's something that Dirk and Dave can access, but the students can't. If they wanted to, they could certainly jump in there and play around with it. It is, uh, it is a mouthful. Uh, sure. There's a lot of stuff in there. We have to write the manual. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just interested as a tool, especially for a class like Econ 1 or 2, where you might have some students that are uh, don't feel engaged by the concepts, and can you take a C student and turn them into a B plus student more engaged now in the theory, and it's not so abstract to them that they're actually playing with the concepts? Yeah, I think you can. Um, but, but, Certainly on a much smaller scale, I've, been, I've done something like this in the last few years where I would send, them, send my students out to play a, what's called a lemonade stand game. Which, and I, I just simply tell them, well, this is like the world's stupidest game. Right? You know, and, you, and you probably think, I can, I can figure out the perfect price to sell my lemonade at. But then you, have, then you suddenly realize that you've got to worry about the amount of sugar that goes in there and how much ice, and, right, and the ice is going to melt, the sugar is going to spoil. Right? And, you know, and then, you, know, you think, I can beat this. And I've had students report back to me, well, I got on the Lemonade game thinking, oh, yeah, it's part of my homework. I'll just crush this in a couple of minutes and print out a print screen and I'm done. Seven hours later, I'm addicted to the Lemonade game and, you know, I can't <laughs> stop playing it. I know that's going to happen to a pretty sizable chunk of the class. And that's exactly what you're talking about, right? The level of engagement goes from marginal to, like, I'm invested in this. And that's, 
I don't know if it's going to manifest itself in going from a C to a B plus, but I don't care. Engaged. Yeah, just from an engagement standpoint and how they talk about it with their friends and what we did in class and what we did, that, that's the value in it. Did you ever envision this becoming like the course? Well, then I'd, have to, I'd be virtual me up there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Where you would, you know, have them start and at the beginning with some, con you know, some yeah. basic concepts and then kind of build this way up. No, I think I think you could certainly <laughs> see that. Um, I certainly could see this as being um, a vehicle in a hybrid course, especially or an online course uh, where you're trying to flesh out different ideas at different points in time. I think there is a narrative in a big classroom and a little bit different environment, so this is more of a plug-in or an add-on in its current form, but I mean, I think it's a very, very valuable piece of sort of saying this is what you need to get out of this course. Can you set up the scenarios to focus on particular topics that maybe supply and demand is what you're covering this week? Can you limit the scenarios to that just so mm -hmm. that they're learning that and they're not getting scenarios that are related to topics that they haven't learned yet? Right. It could be potentially. It would require some constraints, I think, to put in on the functionality uh, of the game. A lot of it is really tightly interwoven, so supply and demand and externalities have both have impact in making responsive decisions or something like that. Um, but it, yeah, potentially. You could certainly set it up that way. <coughs> well, it's one twenty. Are there any other questions for the good of the order? I think this was really cool. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir, Dirk and Dave, for, for one, being a part of this project, but also coming down to share their thoughts on, on the game. So it's, it's a work in progress. Hopefully we'll have some results to report at some point on this. Oh, I know. Can, is it able to for us to log in? Play. Absolutely. So, <laughs> like I said, we're testing yeah, it, but yeah, I can send that URL to Can you put the URL in the chat room? Sure thing. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not, not during work, of course. <laughs> All professional development. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Able to keep my campus from going bankrupt. <laughs> 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 it's funny because there's a really old simulation out there called uh, Virtual View, but it's about keeping a campus running from an administrative standpoint, <laughs> hiring faculty, making sure they're happy, and so on. This is really kind of a nice compliment to that. Yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so I shared it in the. In the so we connect chat, but I'll be happy to email everyone who signed in today if you'd like to take a look at it. Great. So I'm certainly welcome to you. <coughs> Is there any talk about branding it? Any other buildings or 